Well, so nice to be here. Thank you, Jill, for inviting me. Uh, I do live just down the street in East Arlington, and I'm flying all over the place to give this talk in various versions, so it's nice to be able to just drive five minutes to Tufts. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about sexual assault and the brain and behavior and memory and experience. The experience of assault is, is vital as well, as we'll see. And I'm going to do it in a way that is grounded in decades of neuroscience research and is easily absorbable and relevant to you guys. Both of those things can be done. So a little bit of an overview. First, I'm going to start off by talking about what it means to do something in a trauma-informed way and say a little bit about that. And then I'm going to delve into the brain stuff. And that'll be, I'm going to talk about some key brain circuitry. So again, I'm not going to hit you with like a blizzard of names of brain regions because that wouldn't be particularly helpful. I'm going to talk about very important circuitries that are affected in the midst of a sexual assault uh, that are very well studied circuitries and that we can all relate to our own experience to what we're hearing from sexual assault victims we're talking to and I think it's going to make a lot of sense to you and I'm going to after I introduce those circuitries I'm going to delve into you know what's happening to them in the midst of an assault. Then I'm going to the second half will be about trauma and memory again based in Lots of decades of research, especially neuroscience research on, on stress and memory and how the hippocampus is affected. That's a key brain area we will talk about. And then implications. The implications of this are really going to be woven throughout. Um, so I, I'm going to have a little bit at the end when we'll talk about that, but I'll try to weave them all the way through. So what do I mean by trauma-informed? Two key elements of this. If we want to do something in a trauma-informed way, whether it's trauma-informed education of children or trauma-informed investigations, we need to understand the experience of the traumatized person, both in the midst of when that trauma is happening to them and in the aftermath. And today I'm really going to focus on that in the midst of the trauma in the time we have here. So one aspect of it is the victim's experience and we'll talk about the brain bases for why they're having these kinds of experiences. But another really key aspect is what we call victim-perpetrator dynamics. What are the dynamics of the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator? Because we need to understand those because to do our jobs well and not to re-traumatize someone, we have to relate to them in exactly the opposite way of the dynamics of the trauma. So some things about the victim experience, which I'm going to talk about and unfold over the next two hours. Fear. Fear is an essential part of the experience. Now, in two hours, even in eight hours when I do that version, you still can't cover everything. And there are people, of course, who are literally unconscious because they have had so much to drink or they've been drugged or something like that. Or they may pass out in the midst of it at some point, as we'll talk about, and not due to fear, not due to drugs. But what I'm talking about here today is people who are conscious. They may be intoxicated to some extent, but they're conscious enough that they can perceive at some point that they are being assaulted, they are being attacked. And when that perception kicks in, uh, so many shifts happen in the brain, and that's going to be a big, big part of what I talk about. So fear is absolutely central, phenomenologically and in terms of what happens in the brain. Attention is another thing that I'll keep coming back to. Where is someone's attention when they're being assaulted? Because where our attention goes determines what we're going to encode into memory and potentially store away and be able to retrieve later. And people don't pay attention to the things that they wish they had paid attention to, that you may wish they paid attention to, that you may think they should have paid attention to, that they may think they should have, or their boyfriend or whoever. And so attention, what happens to people's attention in states of fear is incredibly important. And there's a brain basis for that that we'll talk about. So fear, attention, habits and reflexes are going to be a big part of my talk. Um, right now we all, you know, we're all basically creatures of habit, right? But we all have a prefrontal cortex that I'll be talking about in a little bit that can do various things to help us not just be stimulus response organisms, to actually plan and have goals and live according to our values and things. In the midst of a trauma, that stuff tends to go out the window. And what people fall back on are habits and reflexes. And these are very well studied phenomenon in animals and in human beings. And the brain basis of a lot of that is known. And I'm going to talk about that. And then, of course, memory. Um, 
So these are four key aspects of the victim's experience. They're going to be woven through my talk today and including the interconnections between them. So victim perpetrator dynamics, you know, this image of someone being held down, physically restrained, a woman in this case, which is most common, of course, but men have this experience too. What kind of image is this, right? This is an image of someone who is profoundly disempowered. Physical force may be combined with alcohol, may be combined with threats, even if they're not being physically restrained. There's other ways that people can be dominated in these situations, including just by the fear that gets evoked in, in them and how that can render them relatively helpless. But so we want to think about the dynamics, the victim-perpetrator dynamics. One of the key ones is disempowerment. To be on the receiving end of a sexual assault is to be dominated and to be disempowered. And anybody read a book by uh, Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman? Great book. Um, and in the whole second half, she talks about how this is a key element of the dynamics of trauma and to help people heal and to seek justice. We need to do just the opposite. We need to give people power and we'll get to that. But the other key dynamic between a, a perpetrator and a victim of sexual assault is disconnection. To be treated as an object that someone is going to use for some power, sex, trip, for acting out some porn fantasy on you, whatever it might be, you are treated as an it, as an object, not as a thou, not as a moral agent, not as someone worthy of dignity. You are treated as an object. And this is one of the most horrific things about sexual assault, quite apart from what goes in what orifice or does not. Just that this person who, maybe it's a person you know, maybe it's an acquaintance, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a boyfriend, whoever it might be, that they would treat you as an object like this is at the core of what it is to be assaulted and what it is to be traumatized in this way. And so these are things that we always want to keep in mind. When we're sitting across from somebody and talking to someone who's been assaulted in this way, this is what they just went through or what they went through a couple weeks ago or however many months it's taken them to screw up the courage uh, or put a label on it to realize they want to talk to someone about it. Profound disempowerment and profound disconnection in a way that can just shatter their beliefs about who they are and who other people are and a variety of other things that I don't have time to get into. So, yeah, let me, before I get into that. Um, so if that's the dynamics of, of sexual assault, to be disempowered and be disconnected, then when we are engaging with people who have been through that, we need to do just the opposite. We need to be giving them power and helping them feel that we are connected to them. Now, this does not mean losing our objectivity or neutrality as an investigator, as an adjudicator, but it does mean having compassion for them as a human being who has gone through this and relating to them in ways within our role, within the structures of the process that we're involved in with them, in ways that give them choices, that inform them about what's going to happen so that they're not just sitting there wondering what's coming at them next in the way they were in the sexual assault because that's going to reenact the trauma for them and bring up a lot of fear and a lot of other problems. So we want to consciously be trying to do the opposite. And it doesn't mean we have to lay it on real thick and be like overly empathic in a way that's going to turn someone off, especially some guys who are not into that kind of touchy-feely whatever. But it does mean that we need to empathize with their experience and really do what we can to give them power within the constraints of the system and the process we're involved in in our role and to really give them the experience that we are connected to them, that we value them as a person. And it may seem too basic to mention, but it's really, really important. And it's easy if we kind of fall back in a neutral, what we perceive as a neutral objective role for, for the traumatized person to experience that as actually a repetition of disempowerment and disconnection. So I just want to throw that out there as kind of framing all of this. OK. So one of the key brain circuitries I'm going to talk about is the prefrontal cortex. So here we have an image of a brain, the outer part of the brain primarily, the cortex, right, the folded part. So this evolved last. Um, it's most developed in human beings. In particular, there's an area here in the front called the prefrontal cortex. And this is where the brain has what we call executive functions. So right now, to pay attention to me or to toggle your attention back and forth between that image and my voice or looking at me and that, and 
a way that you're doing it to deliberately try to learn and absorb things. And you know, you've got lots of other responsibilities and things going on in your personal lives that could be intruding at certain times, of course. It's your prefrontal cortex that allows you to focus your attention in what we call a top-down way. This higher evolved part of your brain is focusing your attention based on the tasks and the goals you have for this situation. That's one of the prefrontal cortex functions. Another prefrontal cortex function is basic reasoning processes to be able to think through how you're going to respond to a situation, not just stimulus and response, to be able to draw on memories and plans in order to think, well, if I do that, then this could happen. If I say this, hmm, that Vic, the person I'm talking to, she just kind of shrunk in the chair after I said that, maybe I need to. All these sorts of reasoning processes we can engage in. This is all prefrontal cortex. Another one that I just worked in there is the ability to monitor ourselves, to monitor, like, is this effective? What I'm doing here, you know, if I'm trying to get my son to clean his, you know, bring his plate from the dinner table, and he's, you know, ignoring me, blowing me off, whatever, I start to get frustrated. It's my prefrontal cortex that can allow me, hopefully, not to just raise my voice in like an unkind way and say, all right, I'm getting frustrated here. I just need to be firm but clear. It's our prefrontal cortex that allows us to live up to our highest values as a human being and to monitor our behavior, think it through. It's also our prefrontal cortex that allows us to inhibit impulses. So if I had the impulse to yell at my son, it would be my prefrontal cortex would allow me to like, oh, put on a break on that. And also just to modulate the intensity of our emotions. You know, if sadness is welling up, if someone's sitting across from you and they've got a horrible piece of that rape memory coming into their mind, um, depending on how much prefrontal cortex function they have, they may or may not be able to modulate that and regulate that. It may just flood them and overwhelm them. Or some people may be like hyper inhibited and they're just keeping everything under wraps. And that's prefrontal cortex too. So the prefrontal cortex is an incredibly important brain region for us as human beings day to day in our work lives and our personal lives. And it's really important to understand how these functions are impacted in the midst of a sexual assault. And we'll get to that. Another really key circuitry is the circuitry of fear. This is one of the best studied circuitries. Most of you have probably heard of this structure, the amygdala, right? Probably everybody has by now, right? It's in the popular culture. Dan Goleman brought it in with emotional intelligence. Um, the amygdala is an incredibly important structure uh, in the brain. A lot of what you read in the media kind of is like overselling what the amygdala does, but it is really important. But the point here is that there's a circuitry of fear of which the amygdala is a key node. The amygdala is involved in other things too. It's involved in desire and sex and other things, but it does have some sub-regions of it that are crucially involved in fear. And in the same way that we're all us using our prefrontal cortices right now, our fear circuitry is always on. Our fear circuitry is always monitoring. It's like a smoke detector. It's always monitoring for signs that unexpected things are happening in the environment, that things aren't going as we would imagine them to be just kind of implicitly based on our prior experience. It's always on searching for any sign of danger. So the fear circuitry is always on and idling and automatically within a quarter of a second tagging everything as potentially dangerous or not. And if something is unexpected or dangerous, it really starts to activate. And when it does, when an attack, for example, in a sexual assault is detected, when the person realizes, oh my God, this guy is using me. Now, there may not be words for this. I'm talking about it like a visceral kind of level, at an automated level that they are under attack. This circuitry can detect that, and then it can really shift things. And we're gonna, that's a lot of what we're going to unfold over the next hour and a half or so. So the fear circuitry, incredibly important. There's a guy named Joe Ledoux who in the 70s said, I'm going to study the emotion in the brain. I want to study it in a way that's preserved across rats, monkeys, human beings, and various other species as well. And he developed these really elegant research paradigms, and he's still doing the work 40-some years later, and as are many other labs. There's literally tens of thousands of papers now on the amygdala and its subregions, and there's pharmacological manipulations, and you know, all kinds of things that people have done to study this circuitry. And they're arguing over like submillimeter regions. So this is very, very well-known stuff that I'm putting up here. There's nothing like out there. It's, it's totally well-established neuroscience research. So what's going on in the brain during sexual assault? A lot of it's going to be about what that fear circuitry is doing and how it's, what's happening to the prefrontal cortex. You know, if we had to just put one line on it, 
the fear circuitry takes control. When the person realizes, when their brain realizes, when their amygdala realizes they are under attack, things shift and the fear circuitry becomes the dominant circuitry of the brain. Well, what does this do? One of the things it does is it causes a loss of prefrontal cortex regulation. Again, we're mostly creatures of habit, but our prefrontal cortex is responsible for guiding us and using those executive functions to allow us to not merely be creatures of habit and to accomplish things and live up to our goals and everything. Well, when the fear circuitry kicks in in the middle of an assault, one of the first things that happens is impairment of this area. And we're going to talk more about that in a bit. Another thing that happens, remember how I said attention is a really important theme in terms of understanding sexual assault, especially the implications for memory. Top-down attention is the prefrontal cortex focusing attention. Bottom-up is the fear circuitry focusing attention on things that seem like they could save your life or are, are vital to coping with a situation. We're going to unfold that. Survival reflexes, again, when your prefrontal cortex is impaired, you're falling back on reflexes. Reflexes that are baked into our brains by hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Um, and those can kick in and do things that people are very embarrassed and ashamed about, maybe afraid to tell you as investigators about because it thinks they mean they were, it means they were at fault or they were a coward or they didn't resist enough and things like that. Things that are counterintuitive if we don't understand these things. And so we're going to spend some time really talking about these reflexes. Self-protection habits, hab habitual responses people engage in that may seem really baffling and like could be evidence of consent, but actually if we collect all the data, a lot of times we can see they're consistent with fear, terror, or trauma. And then altered memory encoding and consolidation. Consolidation means the process of storing things away so that they can be retrieved later after the initial encoding. So this is what we're going to unpack. When the fear circuitry is in control, at some point in the assault, if they're not rendered unconscious, that is going to happen. The fear is going to kick in and it's going to dominate the way their brain is functioning. Now, of course, there's some assaults that can play out over 45 minutes, an hour and a half, someone can be held and, and repeatedly abused over hours and they may go up and down in their levels of fear circuitry versus prefrontal cortex. Again, in two hours I can't cover everything, but I'm focusing here on these fear dynamics and what's going on in the brain and the implications of that for your work. You guys with me so far? Any questions? So high stress and fear equal an impaired prefrontal cortex. Amy Arnston at Yale, here's a publication in Science, a really nice review a few years ago in uh, Nature Reviews Neuroscience. She's the leader in the world on this. She's been studying this for decades, her and her colleagues and grad students. They've worked this stuff out to great detail. So when the fear circuitry kicks in, Basically, there's a subnucleus of the amygdala called the central nucleus, and it sends a signal to the brainstem, and that says, hit the prefrontal cortex with nor, nor, more norepinephrine and dopamine. Now, you don't have to remember the chemicals here. I'm just saying it's worked out well. So fear circuitry triggers the release of chemicals that hit the prefrontal cortex and impair it. Chemicals that at moderate levels are helping us focus right now, but at high levels impair it. Literally make it hard for neurons to communicate with each other. Brain cells to lack the communication capacities, networks break down, there's a lot more noise in the system. They've worked this out through all kinds of experimental manipulations and paradigms. We don't need them to tell us though, right? We've all had experiences where something terrified us, something freaked us out. How many of you guys have been in a car accident? Most of us have been in a car accident, right? Hopefully no one got terribly hurt. Most of us have been in a car accident or, or you know, saw our kid like head into the road and almost get hit by a car. And literally within a couple seconds, right, you can be so impaired that you can't even think straight. And, and you're shaking and your heart is pounding. This is the impairment of our prefrontal cortex. We've seen it in ourselves. We see it in police officers and soldiers. We see it in day-to-day -day life when, when, when we're really freaked out or afraid. And these guys have worked it out in incredible detail what's going on in the brain when this is happening. But it's a really important part of understanding sexual assault is that that part of our brain that allows us to focus our attention where we choose to based on our goals for coping with a situation, for thinking through like, hmm, how can I respond to this? Oh, there was a door open. Maybe I could, you know, get down the hall after all. Wait a minute. There's people next door who might hear me yell. The parts of the brain that would help you think through this stuff they're impaired severely, usually within a, you know, a second or two after the fear really kicking in. So here's an example from a training I did um, of victim advocates in Wisconsin a couple years ago. 
a woman who uh, was saying that she was hanging out with her sister and in uh, their, her apartment in Chicago. They were in the bedroom, they were getting ready to go out that night, and uh, they were you know, talking about where they were gonna go, who they were gonna see, and suddenly you hear this sound in the living room. And her sister said, and they both freeze, and her sister says to her, call 911. She says, what's the number? Like, how impaired are you when someone says call 911 and you don't know the number? And you say, what's the number? Right, she literally couldn't even think through something like that. So that's just one example of how ridiculously impaired our brains can be when the fear kicks in within one to two seconds. Where does your attention go in this image? Barrel. To the barrel of the gun, right? Maybe to his eyes. Now those of you who are more scientifically minded may say, well, they're centrally located and more illuminated, which is true. But however, if you look at the research, and if you talk to any cop who's investigated muggings for 20 years, they know that when someone's holding a gun or someone's got a knife pointed at you, it captures your attention. And it's not your prefrontal cortex that says, hmm, I think I'll focus on that gun. No, it's your fear circuitry that automatically can't take your mind off that gun. Now, I'm not saying that in sexual assaults people have guns or knives. We know that's the myth, right? Most of them are acquaintance. There's no weapon involved. But attention is still working in the same way. The person is still focusing their attention based on fear, on what their fear circuitry thinks is gonna help them survive this situation. And when someone is being raped, the research suggests that half or more of rape victims uh, believe that they're gonna be killed or severely injured in that rape. Anybody read Missoula? Yeah, I mean, remember, the, I'm forgetting her name, but one of, one of the women in that, in that book, she was raped by a guy who she'd been friends with since childhood and who knew really well and felt really safe to us. She wakes up with him penetrating her from behind and she thinks, oh my God, if he would do this to me, he could kill me. And I'm not saying it's some elaborate thought process in her prefrontal cortex. It's like a visceral thing, like, oh my God, someone would use me in this way, treat me as an object in this way, maybe they could kill me. And so people are, tend to be very afraid and their attention gloms onto anything that they think could signal survival or not in this situation or could help them focus. And that could be the tone of the guy's voice. It could be the expression um, in his eyes. Who knows what it could be? And we have no right to second guess. It's their fear circuitry glomming onto what seems significant. And one of the other things it can do is the sensations and the emotions of this can be so horrible that the person may focus on one of those grates up there or may focus on a spot on the ceiling or something like that. That's also a fear-driven tunnel vision, bottom-up attention to try and now trying to escape from the horror of what's happening in their body. So when the fear kicks in, attention is no longer governed by the prefrontal cortex and what makes sense and all that. It's driven by moment-to-moment -moment fear assessments of the amygdala and the fear circuitry, either focusing on things that seem like they're gonna potentially save your life or help you deal with this, or escaping from it and focusing on something in order to try and deal with it that way. So attention is really, really important. And again, when we think about memory, where the attention went is what they're gonna be more likely to remember. So we've got impairment of the prefrontal cortex, we've got bottom-up attention, which probably flows from the impairment of the prefrontal cortex as well as fear circuitry activity. Now these survival reflexes. I'm gonna talk about one and then I'm gonna talk about habits and I'm gonna talk about more survival reflexes. So here we're gonna do a little experiential. Anybody afraid of snakes? Um, I'm gonna tell you what this is, okay? So this is a video. The camera is gonna pan across a snake and at some point that snake is gonna jump out at the toward the screen at you. So feel free to close your eyes, plug your ears, whatever you wanna do. But it can be useful just to sort of experience this, see what happens. You can't help it, even though I told you. I used, to, I used to be real cruel, especially with the cops. I wouldn't even tell them what was coming. But, <laughs> but um, you know, now I make a point to everybody. I just tell you what to expect so you can close your eyes if you want. But even though I told you, even though it's just on a screen, even though you know it's not going to hurt you, you can't help it, right? These are reflexive responses. In the same way, 
there are many responses that a person can have to a sexual assault, which are effectively ref reflexive responses. They're, they're a little, you know, technically we could say they're a little less reflexive, like a, you know, pure brainstem thing, but for all intents and purposes, they're reflexive. They're often called animal defense responses, but they kick in automatically quite outside of conscious choice or control, certainly outside of any prefrontal cortex involvement, and they're triggered very, very rapidly under certain conditions. So that, you know, what you experienced there was a startle response. There's actually a whole literature on what we call fear potentiated startle. So some of you, your fear circuitry is idling at a bit higher level and you had bigger startle responses. And some of that's genetic, some of that could be history, it could be context, there's a variety of causes for that. But the point is, in the same way those responses for us were involuntary and automatic, it's the same thing in the midst of a sexual assault. People are having lots of responses that are totally involuntary, that they may be afraid to tell you about, ashamed to tell you about, that could be really important information because those responses are not consistent with consensual sex. And that's a big part of what the point is here today. There's a lot of things that happen to the brain and body in states of assault, in states of fear, that if we know how to collect that information in a non-leading way, we can really piece that together with all the other information we have and make a get a pretty compelling picture of whether this was consensual or not. So the first reflexive response that kicks in in a sexual assault, when the fear circuitry realizes that an attack is happening, which if someone's got a couple beers or a couple glasses of wine on board might take them longer, right? And we'll talk about that later, how, you know, why do we drink? We drink to, you know, be less anxious and less fearful so socially. And that can mean you miss the, the cues, but at some point, if you're not rendered unconscious, at some point during an assault, you are going to realize, the victim is going to realize he or she is being assaulted and the fear circuitry is going to kick in. And when it does, the first response that tends to happen, it might last just a second or so, it might last for several seconds, is a freeze response. Think deer in the headlights, right? The deer's walking across the road, going to some greener grass on the other side, you come barreling up in your car, the deer freezes and is immobile, and hopefully you're not going to hit it and destroy your car and kill the deer. Or think a rabbit. You know, a lot of us have had this experience, right? You're walking along a path or you're walking up to your garden and you see the rabbit before it sees you. And then when it detects you, when its fear circuitry detects you, it freezes, its ears go up. Well, what is it doing, right? These are evolved responses. We see them across various species, not just mammals. They're responses where that when that smoke detector of the lateral nucleus of the amygdala detects danger or something that could be dangerous, it halts all other processes going on. So the organism can stop moving. One reason for stopping moving is because you're less likely to draw the attention of the predator. Another reason to stop moving is so you can devote all your resources to receiving information. Your pupils dilate, your eyes get bigger, you're looking for where is this predator, what kind of attack could this be, where are my escape routes, all this stuff happens automatically. So it's a state of immobility that's transient for appraising the threat and the potential for escape. It's a state of the organism where the organism is primed to suddenly burst into action. So the animal is frozen or the person freezes when they detect they're being assaulted, but there's other changes happening that prime them to potentially, not necessarily, spring into action. So from the perspective of the autonomic nervous system, all of our hearts would be beating at about 110 bit beats per minute right now if it wasn't for the break that the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system puts on the heart. So the sympathetic is like an accelerator, the parasympathetic is like a break. We always have the break on to some extent. Those of us who are maybe more athletic, who do a lot of running and stuff, we may have heart rates around like in the high 50s or something. That's because you've got a really good parasympathetic break and a lot of what we call vagal tone, but anyway, in the midst of this freezing state, what happens is the accelerator and the brake get slammed on at the same time. So that heart rate doesn't necessarily escalate, but blood pressure is going up and the sympathetic activation, that accelerator is pushed on there so that if the brake comes off, and it can come off in a fraction of a second because there's an insulating sheath of myelin from the brain stem to the heart for the parasympathetic, but not the sympathetic. So you get this super fast break that can just pop off, right? And one of those two animals can just bound away just like that. So the freezing state is it's the first reflexive response that kicks in when fear is detected. 
It's a state of immobility. It's a state of activating for potential fight or flight, but mostly flight, right? And it's a state of appraisal to really try and absorb the situation and how you might be able to escape. It's also an incredibly important moment to listen for in any account of sexual assault that you're listening to. There is almost always this moment where someone will be able to remember there was this moment when they realized, again, maybe not with words, maybe not prefrontal cortex, when they realized something was wrong here, this guy was going to attack me. It could have been a look that came over his face, like the mask comes off, this guy I thought was a nice guy is now looking at me in this menacing way or in this kind of blanked out, scary way. It could be when he locked the door in this like certain way. It could be when he didn't take no for an answer the third time and started to pull in a more firm way on my shirt. Who knows, right? But there's these moments, a, there's usually a moment in the assault where the fear kicks in and the person often will recall that they froze. This doesn't happen during consensual sex. Now it may if you have a history of childhood sexual abuse or prior trauma and someone touches you a certain way that triggers a memory of an old assault, that can happen. But in general, if I'm making love to my wife, I am not like suddenly freezing and you know, going into one of these states, right? So this is not consistent with consensual sex. It's a brain-based response to fear. And in every, just about every sexual assault assessment you're going to do or anything you hear as an adjudicator, if the, if the investigation works well, you should be able to know when that moment kicked in. Now, if, it, if they don't remember, if they don't say it, I'm not saying that means, oh, they weren't assaulted. But this is really important information to listen for and to gather from people who are reporting sexual assault because it's a key moment that is present in just about every sexual assault. So just to emphasize this, this is the moment when the fear kicks in. It's such an important moment for us to know about and to give an assault victim the sense that it's safe to tell us about this, that they don't have to be ashamed about this happening, how they froze and didn't do anything just when they might have been able to escape if they had whatever. Because a lot of people beat up on themselves for having this freeze response. And it's a super important moment because this doesn't happen in consensual sex unless someone's getting an old trauma triggered. This fear kicks in and the person freezes. It's a crucial moment to listen for brain-based response baked in by millions of years of evolution. So now I'm going to show a video. Anybody watch Mad Men? Um, this is from, uh, I think it's season three. So Joan is one of the main characters. That's her, he's her fiance at the time. She later goes on to marry him. Um, they're going out for a special dinner, as you can see by the flowers she's got there. Um, this is going to be disturbing, okay? So I'm going to show you this video in a couple pieces. So it's, it is, in terms of television or film, it is one of the most realistic depictions of sexual assault. Um, and I'm showing it to you because there's, it really is illustrative and helps make some of the points I'm making. But I just want to, you know, it is kind of disturbing. Fix me a drink, will you? I don't know. You know what these guys do all day? I've seen the movies. Pretend like I'm your boss. Donald Draper. OK, one drink. Dr. Harris, are you trying to examine me? Maybe. <laughs> Not in here. That Sterling guy knows an awful lot about you. I've been working here for nine years. Well, Greg, don't. It isn't my office. It's OK. So. This is her fiance, right? At first, she's flattered by the attention. Are you trying to examine me, right? Then she says no a couple times. And then this happens. Either right before that or certainly by that moment, something major is shifting in her brain, right? Her body knows. Her fear circuitry knows she is now under attack. This is something we need to really listen for and try to collect this information and put it together with all the other 
information and evidence that we collect. So that's the first response that can kick in. That's a reflexive freeze response when the fear really kicks in. Another thing we see a lot is habits, habit responses that people have. And let's just reflect for a minute on what these might look like. Polite responses to unwanted sexual advances or mistreatment. You know, sadly, to grow up in our culture, especially as a young woman, um, by the time anybody's gotten to Tufts, they probably had a number of experiences where they had to pull, you know, they had some guy trying to go further than they wanted to sexually. And they've learned, and they've been conditioned through what they see on TV, what they hear from their friends, just general gender socialization, how to respond politely in a way that doesn't hurt his ego, doesn't make him more angry at me. You know, it's bad enough I'm rejecting him. I'm going to do it in a way that doesn't look like a rejection. You know, I got to go home now. Uh, I'm not ready. You know, your girlfriend will find out. My boyfriend will find out. There's all these polite things that people say to try and ward off unwanted sexual advances or escalations beyond where they are consenting to. But there's other ways that we all have these experiences, right? We've all learned how to politely respond to aggressive and dominant people. You know, in the military, who I often teach, right, it would be a superior officer. Could be a boss you have at work and you're a teenager working in a job. Could be, you know, a dominant kid on the playground or among your friendship group, you know, who can get aggressive or whatever. We've all learned that there are face-saving ways to diffuse conflict situations where someone is trying to dominate and be aggressive to us in our personal lives, in our work lives. So we've got these habits that, that are there for how to deal with aggressive people in a face-saving way for them and us. And that's really a, such a big part of it. It's about hoping and pretending it's no big deal and trying to save face for yourself and the other person. And this is what happens in a lot of sexual assaults. So first I'm gonna show you an example, another video of nothing to do, it's not a sexual assault, but just to see these behaviors, and you know, it's a little bit funny. Um, so this guy here is a mortgage agent. This is, I'm pretty sure it's his boss, somebody who's superior to him in some way in the structure. And this is a guy who's ostensibly there to get a mortgage. He's really a friend of his playing a prank on this guy. Glad peace toast? No, thank you. <laughs> so how you doing? Good. So you live now, you rent somewhere right now? Right now? No, no, right now? <clears throat> Like, no, he's like, he'll freeze. Who do you think he's sick? 
like, I don't know, I said, I keep saying it. I'm like, are you all right? He's like, yeah, yeah, well, it's bad. What'd you ask me? He doesn't remember. Because like, sometimes I just look and space out a little bit. But dude, dude, dude I don't, I'm telling you, it's really bad. I don't think you realize what I'm saying. He'll go like this. For like 30 seconds. And then I'll snap out of it. Are you okay? Uh, 3.5% on an FHA purchase. So I'm going to assume, because he doesn't have a lot of money to put down, I'm going to assume it's FHA. That's like seven grand. He says he has yeah. three grand now. What's wrong with this guy? Who? What are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> See the box over there? <laughs> Tony, what, what happened there? <laughs> well, uh, my good man Glenn here, we uh, preyed on his compassionate side today, and uh, we got a little ugly face footage with Glenn during an application. That was more than ugly face footage. I thought the guy was going to pass out. <laughs> really, I was going to call 911. That was really uh, scary, but I'm actually happy to be the butt of the joke. But what do we see on the outside, right? He's calm. By the third time, he's just like doing things on his phone. He's acting like something. Inside, he's totally freaking out, afraid he's going to have to call 911, that this guy's going to like fall down on the floor and who knows what's going to happen to him. And notice what, what he said. He said, we prayed on his compassion inside. And you know, this is what a lot of perpetrators of sexual assault are doing, basically. They are preying on the kindness on the, the socialization, especially of girls, to be polite, to be helpless, really, in the face of escalating aggression. They're preying on that. And afterwards, it may sound, they may, they may say to you, you know, you may hear from the perpetrator, the victim may even report, well, you know, I told him, you know, I, I had to go home or, uh, you know, he was married, so maybe we shouldn't do it, or he, had a, a, he has a girlfriend or whatever. And sometimes these can be interpreted as like, well, you know, she wasn't really sure if she wanted to go further or whatever. But a lot of the times the person is terrified. And if you really listen and, and, and give them the space to talk about their experience, they will describe how while they're saying these things that on the surface just same, sound like the same old polite things you say to ward off unwanted sexual advances, they're actually freaking out inside and terrified. And they may be stuck with these kinds of responses. So one way I think about this is I call the fear habit paradox. Why does the fear kick in? Because an interaction goes from a normal expected scenario to an unexpected attack. Oh, yeah, this is just one more guy trying to go further than I want him to go. But then suddenly, whoa, this is more. And when that happens and the fear circuitry really kicks in, when it's been detected, then what can happen is these initial fear-based responses to attack are habitual behaviors appropriate to a scenario that's just been left behind. The person can persist. And I've seen this in many ca rape cases I've worked on. They persist in these habitual responses that would have worked if he was a nice guy who would take no for an answer. But he's gone beyond that. And the fear has kicked in. Their prefrontal cortex is impaired. And they're just, their brain is just clinging on to these now utterly ineffective habits that are just going to result in them getting raped, basically. So the habits kick in. They've got these habits to draw on from years of socialization as girls, and but men have these, you know, how to deal with dominant people too. The habits are there. Then at some point it goes beyond, and now it's they're under attack, and they persist in the habit. And we have a word. Well, here's some examples. You know, I've said some of these before. I have to leave soon. You've got a girlfriend. My roommate is home. Right? People can be raped right where the roommate is you know, right next door asleep. My boyfriend will be angry. These are the kinds of things people say, which on the surface, you know, sound like, oh, well, maybe she just wasn't sure if she wanted to do it. She was ambivalent about whether she wanted to have sex. But in fact, if you gather the information, you can see that this person was terrified. And these were just all they could come out with in that terrified state with these habitual kind of things that they say when it's not a terrifying state. Here's an example of this in another situation. So uh, there was a woman in a training I did a couple months ago who talked about how her mom 
had uh, been in the hospital. Her mom had a stroke. She was in the hospital for a couple weeks. She had finally came out. They were at home. They were sitting in the living room, um, hanging out. Her dad's there too. And suddenly her mom starts having a seizure. And she says to her dad, call 911. And her father's hitting on the phone, trying to get, and it's like minutes, you know, she's trying to make sure she doesn't fall off the couch, that she doesn't bite her tongue, things like that. And she's like, dad, call 911. Why are you calling 911? And he's like, I am, the phone's not working. She comes over, takes the phone away from him. He's dialing 991 over and over and over again. Because they lived in a part of the country where one of the exchanges is 991. And so he's used to calling 991. And when the fear kicks in, even though what he really needs to do is call 911, he can't, and he doesn't have that prefrontal cortex ability to say, hmm, this isn't working. Maybe I should carefully see what numbers I'm pushing. He just keeps pushing the same wrong sequence. And this is uh, from an autism site. If at first you don't succeed, perseverate. Right? So pers this is perseveration. When the brain is in this fear state, and the fear circuitry is running the show, and the prefrontal cortex is gone, then people can engage in this perseveration. They will perseverate in, in some utterly ineffective habitual response that, again, might have worked if he was a nice guy. He would take no for an answer. But they perseverate even up to the point where he's pulling off their pants and about to penetrate them. They're still saying, you're married or you know, your girlfriend's going to find out. Now, looking back, they're going to feel embarrassed that they did that. They're going to feel ashamed. They're going to feel afraid that you're not going to believe them, that they're going to be blamed, they didn't resist enough, all that sort of stuff. But this is a brain-based response. And this goes back into the 50s, like people who you know, have strokes in the, in the prefrontal cortex or who get shot in the prefrontal cortex. One of the behavioral symptoms you see is what we call perseveration. They will engage in some sort of behavior. The environment is giving them feedback that's not working, and they just keep doing it. And so what we're seeing is a transient impairment of the prefrontal cortex caused by fear, where people can perseverate in utterly ineffective habit behaviors. And it doesn't mean that they weren't resisting enough. It doesn't mean they were consenting. It means they were in a terrified state where they had no prefrontal cortex functionality, and they were just perseverating on, on habits. Does this make sense? OK. Another place where these habits come from is uh, old responses to childhood abuse. So, you know, sadly, the rates of childhood physical, emotional, and sexual abuse are pretty high in our culture and other cultures around the world. Um, a lot of your students coming in here, they may be really smart, they may be well-adjusted in a lot of ways. A lot of them have histories of physical, sexual, emotional abuse in childhood. And they have habitual ways they dealt with it in their family, in their neighborhood, the bullying or the abuse at home. So let's think about this little girl, right? If a couple times a week, maybe even just once a month for three or four years of her childhood, this is what she dealt with. An angry, drunk father or stepfather bawling his fist. Maybe he just punched her mother or something. Or maybe it's a mother who's flying out of control. And the way she responds to it is to curl up into a ball and try and get small and hope he won't want to attack her. Right? Maybe her sister responds to it in a different way, by screaming and running out of the house. Who knows? But people have their habitual responses in these childhood trauma situations. And then that may be what emerges when they're in their dorm room with this guy who they thought was a nice guy is now ripping off their clothes or taking advantage of their intoxicated state. And here we have to be careful because we don't necessarily want to open up the can of worms of all their childhood trauma and bringing that in and then have them raked over the coals for that. But we want to have in our minds that some of the responses that people have to sexual assault are actually old habitual responses they had to violence in their home or in their community um, growing up as kids. And they may, you know, you may not necessarily want them to go into that or talk about that, but it's an important thing to realize. Responses that can seem like utterly ineffective, even ridiculous, may have been the response that when they were three, four, five years old, they engaged in when their 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 out of control parent or step parent or whoever was was, you know, abusing them in some way. And when the fear kicks in, this is where people's brains go. They go to old habits and reflexes. Or think of this kid, right? If this is what he went through a couple times a week or even a month, you know, for several years, then when he undergrad here at Tufts and suddenly someone's trying to assault him in some way or is assaulting him in some way, he may fall into this. He may be a big guy. He may be 6'1 now. He may be on the lacrosse team or whatever. But when someone suddenly, you know, because the perpetrator has the element of surprise, and they've usually done it before, when that kicks in, 
this old memory, this old habit learning from the past, that can be what determines the response. And the shame and the fear of telling you about this kind of stuff, it can be huge for people because they, they feel embarrassed and ashamed that they didn't have a different response. But there are ways to give them the space, give them the safety to be able to talk about this. Again, not without, ne without necessarily talking about all their childhood trauma, but to disclose to you what kind of responses they had, even if they're embarrassing. And there's ways for you to normalize that. So freezing kicks in first when the fear kicks in. Then there's someone may fall back on this habit learning that's been socialized into them through gender socialization, through how to deal with dominant people, maybe through childhood trauma. We also have other potential reflexive responses that people can have, especially when at any point during the assault, it could be right at the beginning, right during the freezing, or it could be after some struggle. But if there's some point where their fear circuitry, not their prefrontal cortex, their fear circuitry perceives that there's no escape, the resistance is futile, and escape is impossible. They may later think, of course I could have escaped. The door was open. There were people next door. You may be thinking, oh, come on, of course you could have escaped. But it's not about what your or their prefrontal cortex later thinks. It's about what their fear circuitry automatically appraises as going on. And if it appraises the situation as inescapable and resistance is futile or potentially fatal, then drastic survival reflexes can kick in. One of them is what we call dissociation. Probably most of you guys have heard of this, right? So dissociation, um, the three main things that you're going to see in the midst of an assault is people who are blanking out or spacing out. And again, this kicks in automatically. They're blanking out, spacing out. Suddenly they feel like they're in a dream. They feel like they're in a fog. They feel like this is a movie. They feel like they're floating outside of their body. All right, disconnected from body. They may not necessarily feel like they're floating, but they just may not be able to sense anything going on in their body anymore. Or they may be on autopilot, going through the motions. And this is something that, again, can be very confusing to the victim and to investigators and adjudicators. People can go into a state where their brain shifts in such a way that all those awful sensations and the horror of it all, they somehow disconnect from that. And I've actually personally done brain imaging research on what's happening in someone's brain the more they say they felt like they were in a fog or disconnected from their body. Um, it has to do with an, another circuitry, which we call the embodiment circuitry or interoceptive circuitry. But basically, you know, there's, it's a brain response that kicks in automatically. It's a survival self-protection thing from the horror of what's happening in the body. And part of it can be going on autopilot. And people will later say things like, I was on autopilot or I was doing things, but I didn't really feel like I was choosing to do them. And we have research on this from you know, shootings, from earthquakes, car accidents, sexual abuse, where it's very common, sexual assault, where it's pretty common, where people can just suddenly shift into this mode where they're not feeling connected to their body or the emotional aspects of the experience, and they may just be on autopilot. So they may engage in a lot of sexual behaviors. They may do what the guy tells them. They may you know, put their mouth on his penis. They may do this. They may do that. That doesn't mean they were consenting. We need to gather the information and ask the right questions so that we can see if maybe they went into a dissociative state before that. Maybe they felt like they were a robot going through the motions and they were utterly terrified and they were doing these things and they can't believe they did it and they're embarrassed and ashamed that they did it. But it wasn't like they were like, ooh, I like this. They were actually terrified. So this is dissociative autopilot. And it's so important that we understand the survivor's experience because if we don't, then we don't know what that behavior means. It could be consensual. It could be a terrified dissociative autopilot response. And sometimes you can even get corroboration from the perpetrator um, of some of these things. that they, They're unknowingly giving you information about how they were actually terrifying the person. You know, here's just an image that captures that. And this was related to a research study I did back in the late 90s where, you know, we had a woman who'd been terribly abused by her parents, especially her mom. Graduate of Brown, super smart woman, um, but serious PTSD and trauma. And we reminded her of her worst trauma in this research way we do where we make, make an audio tape that they play to them and then they remember it in detail. Um, one week we did it in the lab and measured her heart rate and skin conductance and stuff like that. And her heart rate went up to like 140 beats per minute and she was sobbing and crying and just bombarded with these awful memories of her mom beating her up. A week later, we take her over to the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. 
And this time, this was before fMRI was really big, we were injected with a radioactive tracer to see when she remembers this trauma, what areas of her brain get more activity. And I've got, I still got the heart rate monitor on before we take her into the scanner room because there's a time delay on, on the uptake of the tracer and everything. And I watch as her heart rate goes down, down, down. I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't what's supposed to happen. People's heart rate's supposed to go up. You know, Roger Pittman, my colleague at Harvard, and others have done all this research. So I was like, wow, I wonder what her experience was. Because if I want to understand what's going on in her brain and why her heart rate's going down, I need to understand the phenomenology of this. And she said, it felt like, this time, it felt like looking at her through a glass wall, like it couldn't touch me. And she also said something that really stood out for me that we'll come back to later. I felt like one, it was like an anti-emotional effect. I felt like I wanted to go to sleep. These were automatic responses. They were very different than the response she had the week before. So there was dissociation um, going on there for her. And this is something you can see. In the midst of an assault, someone can dissociate. In, if you're an investigator in two different interviews with you, one week the person may be sobbing, a week or two later, they may be like they're reading a grocery list as they're describing these horrific things that were done to their body, right? Now, one of the things about this dissociative response is if you don't feel it in your body, it doesn't feel real. And so people will tell you this, and then they'll start to doubt, like, oh, maybe it wasn't that bad. Maybe I'm exaggerating it. You know, I don't know. Is this really rape? You know, I, it doesn't really feel that bad now as I talk about it. And this can be contagious. If they're disconnected from their body, and then you start feeling like, it doesn't, you know, they're describing these horrible things, potentially, but I'm not feeling you, know, you don't necessarily put it into words, but it does, if their experience feels less real, it feels like it was a less violent, it might not even have been an assault. So these are things to look out for. But all this is a reflexive brain response to overwhelming fear and horror about what's happening in your body. And so now I'm gonna, there's gonna be a slight overlap with the last video, and then it's gonna continue past that point. Now I mean it. Greg, this isn't fun. This is what you want, right? Stop. It's okay. Greg, no. really disturbing but what we see here right is someone the fear kicks in she struggles for a while and then at some point and it's the point where penetration starts to happen which is often where this can kick in though it can be before she dissociates her eyes glaze over and you know from a television kind of perspective production directing you know they really capture it you hear the traffic sounds right you hear that sound of the brakes of a bus like 20 floors below and you see the coffee table across there now at this point in the assault if she's trying to remember what happened she may not have any memory for the sensations of being penetrated and the things he was doing to her body from then on but she might be able to describe in incredible detail that or never forget that sound of the traffic below, the sound of the brakes of that bus coming to a stop. She might be able to describe in vivid detail the coffee table, the lamp, the couch, the vases on the coffee table. Police officers and others are not trained to look for this kind of information. You know, they want to know, well, what happened to your body? What happened first, second, third? Hey, if someone remembers that, great, but we can't count on that. But if someone remembers in incredible detail what that coffee table looked like across the room, what that spot on the wall looked like, and they can tell you, I just, I blanked out, I couldn't feel my body anymore, all I could see was that plant or that coffee table or whatever, and they can describe it in exquisite detail, that's really important information. Again, that's not something that happens during consensual sex. You don't go into some tunnel vision state and notice every little thing on the wall across the room or a table or a plant or something like that. So these are things to listen for in people's account that might not be in the first place you would think to look, but they're consistent with assault 
And they can be really compelling evidence when you put it together with everything else. That this person was terrified and in a dissociative state where they were zeroed in on the plant across the room just trying to cope with what the horrible things that were happening in their body by escaping them in that way. And again, not their prefrontal cortex deciding to do this, but automatic reflexive response that kicks in. And so as I talked about before, when people are disconnected from their body, there's this circuitry. I call it the embodiment circuitry because it really gets at this sense of, you know, what does it feel like to be in your body right now, right? You may feel warm. You may feel cold. You may have some pressure here. You may be wanting to move around in your chair or whatever. Any sensation you can feel of tension, pain, warmth, cold, anything, it's all eventually funneling through this part of the cortex where it can be then the focus of, of conscious attention. And this, by the way, gets bigger in, in, in long-term mindfulness meditators and yoga practitioners because um, they're doing a lot of in, in body awareness stuff. So when someone's dissociating, as I found in my own research and others have, there's, a, there's less activation in this area. Literally, there's less processing of body sensations or, and or they're not getting sort of passed on to the, the prefrontal cortex. So that's one Reflexive response that can kick in when the organism, when the fear circuitry detects that escape is impossible, that the worst thing they feared, the penetration, is now happening. So they go from fear to escape and defeat kind of responses. Another one is tonic immobility. And now remember, dissociation is very much about the subjective experience. I mean, there's brain bases for it, but tonic immobility, now here we're focusing more on the actual behavior of the organism. So remember, freezing is when the person is alert and immobile, but they're able to move. They're primed to move, actually, when the accelerator and the brake are on, and they can do something if their brain appraises that as the appropriate response. This is different. In tonic immobility, the person is paralyzed and can't move or speak. Now, this can be so extreme that literally they are trying to move and they are unable. Sometimes it's hard to tell. They just say, I felt like I couldn't move. And they may not even have tried. So, you know, we don't know if they would have tried. They wouldn't have been able to move, likely in many cases. Um, so it's not perfectly like a light switch. There appears to be a continuum of this. And I've, you know, heard cases where people have said, you know, for like 5 to 10, 15 minutes, they were just trying to get movement in their right hand. And then finally they got in their right hand. And then they got in their left hand. And then they were able to start pushing them off a little bit. Um, people who've been in this state for hours while a train of guys raped them. So there's many different variations of this, but what they have in common is the person is unable to move or speak or only in a very, very limited way. What's it caused by? It's caused by extreme fear, physical contact with, contact with the perpetrator, uh, restraint, and the perception of inescapability. Perception is reality. They may later realize they could have escaped because the door was open or whatever, but their brain at that point, the fear circuitry of the brain, perceived that escape was not possible and the stuff can kick in. And it can kick in very quickly. It's not uncommon in sexual and non-sexual assault. So this isn't just about sexual assault. This is about non-sexual assault too. When I say not uncommon, I don't mean like half the time, but you know, probably in the cases are gonna come to you because a lot of them aren't reported obviously. I, you know, 10, 10 to 15, maybe up to 20, 25%. Now you may say, geez, I never heard of this before. Well, a lot of people are really embarrassed and ashamed to acknowledge that they didn't move, that they were unable to move. They think it means there was something wrong with them, that they were weak, that they were a coward. Well, it's actually just a, a well-known brain-based response. And so this has been studied in a lot of different animal species for many years. A guy named Gordon Gallup at UPenn going back into the 60s. Um, you know, he's done a lot of work with chickens. You know, chickens are birds. They evolved from dinosaurs. They've been around a long time, right? So somebody, one of his research assistants, took that chicken, held it, restrained it for a while, let go, and the chicken is not moving. It's rigid. If you go over and hit its legs or something, it's going to do this kind of stuff. It's a rigid, paralyzed state. So here's, a, here's another video example of this. They're about to put tonic immobility to work. Where do you want them? Doc shows Mike how to turn the shark upside down. I know it's a hard to believe, but it's true. Soon, its body becomes catatonic. I can touch the eyes, bend the dorsal fin, even touch the gills, and there's no response. Sharks, think about sharks, right? So sharks have been around, estimates about 300, 350 million years. They haven't changed that much, as the people who study this say. So this is a very old response. Again, going back, dinosaur, shark kind of period. Sharks 
Uh, so the only thing they can take out a shark, pretty much from what I've heard, is, is an orca, right? A killer whale. Otherwise, sharks tend to be the apex predator in their environment. So, you know, I love to say this to the military guys, you know, the tough Marines and the generals and those guys like, look, you know, these guys are apex predators. These guys are tough. But you know what? If you dominate them and turn them over, they can go into this tonic immobility. And the same thing is true for the toughest Marine, the toughest Army soldier. If they are dominated, if they are disempowered in this way that happens in a sexual assault, caught by surprise when they're sleeping, overpowered by one or more people, they can go into this state. Now, not everybody, you know, there's certain, there's clearly some genetic predisposition for some versus others to go into this, but um, it can happen. And it's not as unusual as people would think. So it's over 300 million year old response. It has a sudden onset, usually after a failed struggle, but it can come in very quickly just on the perception of inescapability or the futility of resistance. It tends to suddenly terminate. So an animal or a person can go into this suddenly, and then they can snap out of it suddenly. It can last from seconds to hours. And on its own, it does not impair memory, encoding, or alertness. So just because someone was frozen and unable to move or cry out, doesn't mean they weren't necessarily really taking in the horror of what was happening. It could go with dissociation, so they could be dissociated and tonically immobile, or they could be, have tonic immobility and be all too aware of the horrible sensations in their body and encoding them, you know, relatively speaking, pretty well. Other things to look for, evidence of tonic immobility, fixed or unfocused staring, intermittent periods of eye closure, so not, not blinking, not close the whole time, but closing for a while and opening closing, opening in sort of strange patterns, rigid or trembling muscles. Uh, there's an investigator of Fort Leonard Wood. I do a lot of teaching there, people from all the different services. Um, and Lori Jones at Fort Leonard Wood, she's worked on many cases where the perpetrator has described how, yeah, there was this weird phase where, you know, she, she, her body was kind of shaken in this funny way. It was kind of weird. Well, she was able to piece that together with the victim saying, at that point, I was terrified and unable to move, and I really was trying to scream and couldn't. And now you've got corroboration from the perpetrator. Now, I'm not promising you you're going to get that in these cases. A lot of times they're not going to talk to you at all. They're going to give you a very limited story. But in some cases, you can actually corroborate some of this stuff from the perpetrator. Sensations of coldness, numbing or insensitivity to pain. Obviously, these are subjective things that only the victim can tell you about. And they all also overlap with uh, dissociation. But these are other things that you can listen for and in a non-leading way inquire about to fill in the picture. If someone says they were unable to move and these other things go along with it, then you know, like, hey, this really fits with tonic immobility, which has been studied for a while. And, and these are, these are uh, it's a well-known fear response. And all of this stuff, you know, as I said at the beginning, while being raped, half of victims fear death or serious injury. Because if the person is willing to do this to me, um, treat me as an object like this, you know, give me a life sentence basically for 10 minutes of their pleasure, then who knows what they might be willing to do to me. And so these are responses that kick in when the brain feels like that kind of existential life threat. So that's tonic immobility, rigid, immobile, unable to move or cry out. Think of a possum, right? This is a different state that people can go into. We call it collapsed immobility. It's similar to tonic immobility in that the person can't move or speak. Same causes, extreme fear, physical contact with the perpetrator, restraint, perceived inescapability. It's an evolutionarily old response, and it has a sudden onset, but it tends to have a more gradual offset. And that has to do with some of the physiology of it, which we'll talk about in a minute. Let's just see a couple examples of this. There's a possum in my front lawn. Get him, Rocky. Get the possum. Oh, oh man. So he just flops over, right? And then the dog's not so interested. All these things evolved as ways to try and survive predatory attack. Tonic immobility, not moving. That's not so appealing to a predator if you're not moving at all. And we'll, and we'll see, I think the next video is going to cover that in a different way, yeah.
just as the second coyote senses that a meal is at hand, her mate appears to have lost his appetite. Most predators need the stimulation of resistance to incite them to kill and the act of killing to induce them to eat. An inert body inspires little interest. The possums do also emit an odor, um, but it, a big part of it is the inert body. Now the inner body of a possum though is different than the tonic immobility. It's actually a floppy body. You can find accounts in the air and people have them finding a possum in their backyard and you pick it up and its body is limp. That's what we call it collapsed immobility as opposed to tonic immobility. So here's some key differences from tonic immobility. The physiological cause, the heart gets a massive parasympathetic input. Remember that's the break. And what does that do? It, re it results in an extreme drop in both heart rate and blood pressure simultaneously, which leads the person to feel faint or sleepy. Sometimes they'll say they felt sleepy or outright pass out and lose consciousness, as well as their body going limp. So these are the ways it's different from tonic immobility. It's similar in that it's caused by an extreme fear Restraint, perception of inescapability, it automatically kicks in and we know it goes from the central nucleus of the amygdala to the periaqueductal gray that causes these responses automatically outside of choice. But it's different in that it has this massive drop in, in heart rate and blood pressure which means oxygen to the brain. And so, and it can be on a continuum. So at the most extreme, the person passes out. They can also just describe feeling kind of woozy, sleepy, whatever. And, you know, this was really even just brought to my attention as something I need to focus on more just a few years ago from my teaching of many investigators and prosecutors. And prosecutors were saying, you know, I've had these cases where, you know, the woman says she was assaulted in her room, but and then she, like, went to sleep right afterwards. It's just killing me. The jury and the judge, and they're like, come on, how can you tell me she was raped and is terrified and then she just falls asleep? And one of the causes for this can be in the terrified state, the person actually, they describe it as sleepiness and they pass out um, or they feel you know, really woozy and then they do just go to sleep. But it's based on fear and terror um, and a loss literally of oxygenated blood to the brain. And it's not like, oh, it wasn't a big deal. They just rolled over and went to sleep. So here's a couple other examples. Uh, has anybody ever done this ride called the slingshot? Pretty crazy ride, I haven't done it, but they do this thing where they put a video camera on there and you can buy the DVD from them and then people post them on the internet. And you can see two people, two people, same, same ride, very different brains, very different physiological responses. So there, he passed out, right? He passed out in fear, he came out of it, and was horrified by what was happening, and passed out right again. This can happen in sexual assault. People can go in and out of passing out, out of the terror of it. And they're passed out, and then they come out, and the guy's doing this to them, and, ah, and then they go back into it again. These are responses that we hear from victims, and they have a well-known brain basis. Here's another one.
So again, you know, on the one hand, she's laughing, thinking it's funny, but she's terrified, right? And eventually the terror wins out and she passes out. And this is a, this is a line that, again, this investigator who I work with a lot in uh, Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, she said that many rape victims have said to her, I felt like a rag doll. He was just moving me around. So when someone is in this state, they may fully lose consciousness. They may be, feel really sleepy and like barely conscious as we saw her coming out of that state and kind of dazed. Um, but in that state, the body is limp and the person can just be moved around and the perpetrator can do whatever they want. And, they would, and this is a, not an uncommon metaphor that we hear from people. They felt like a rag doll just being moved around while he did whatever they wanted. It doesn't mean they were consenting. It means they were actually utterly terrified. And this old primitive response to predatory attack kicked in. So we, you know, we often hear, especially from the military folks, you know, about these counterintuitive victim behaviors. Things, you know, well, if they were really being raped, they wouldn't do this or they would do this. And these are the big ones, right? Didn't resist, made no attempt to escape. The door was open. There were people next door. Did not scream. Come on, if they had just yelled or screamed, you know, it would have all stopped right there. Active participant. Well, they went on to do this, this, and this with the guy. Well, everything I've just talked about for the last 40 minutes or so shows that all of these responses can be totally consistent with fear, with terror, with very old, automatic, reflexive responses baked into the human brain by hundreds of millions of years of evolution as well as these, these habits that are socialized into us or, or, or conditioned in, in childhood. So these things that for so long and still in many, many places around, around the world, around this country, um, people point to as evidence of consent or it wasn't really an assault because they didn't resist, they didn't escape, they didn't scream, they actively participated. None of these things can tell us for sure that someone was not assaulted. And if we really listen to victims and help them have the safe space where they can describe to us these responses that they may be really embarrassed and ashamed about, but if we can give them the safety to describe those to those and piece it together with as much information as we can gather from all sources, we can put together often a pretty compelling picture of, no, this was, this was terror, this was assault for sure. And you know, today I'm just focusing on some of the most like, misunderstood things um, that there is a lot of understanding that can be imparted to you guys, but you know, I, I, of course there are many different kinds of assaults and there's many different ways people can respond and things aren't always so clean cut and black and white and I know your jobs are really difficult uh, in sorting this stuff out, so I just wanna acknowledge that. Um, and then I'm gonna show another video. Uh, this one again is fairly obscenity laden, but it's kind of funny.
He's terrified, but what's he doing, right? He's, he's got a seriously impaired prefrontal cortex, right? And he is just glomming onto one simple phrase after another, and he's holding onto these simple phrases for dear life, basically, to try and get through this. And this is what happens to a lot of sexual assault victims. We need to give them the space to tell us about the thoughts that were going through their head. They're not gonna remember all of them, but they will often tell us things like, I was just thinking, oh my God, this can't be happening, this can't be happening, this can't be happening, or I hope he doesn't kill me, I hope he doesn't kill me, or crazy thoughts like, why is he doing this, why is he doing this, why is he doing this? Who knows what's gonna run people's, through people's heads? But again, if we think, compare it to a consensual sex, you know, people don't usually have these simple thoughts that they're just holding on to that are totally, they're grasping onto for dear life when they're having sex, right? But in a sexual assault, this is often what's happening. The person is terrified, their prefrontal cortex is impaired, they can't formulate any complex thoughts at all. They just have these simple ideas that they're holding on to for dear life through the horror of what this person is doing to them. And it's so important that we gather that subjective information and put it together with everything else to piece together what was really going on here. And so that's why I show that video. It's a really good example of someone just one simple phrase after another, just trying to get through a horrific experience. And you'll hear this from victims, right? I was just holding on, getting through it. I just wanted to get it over with, right? This is another one we hear a lot. He's gonna do it to me anyway. Oh my God, if he would do this, he's already overpowered me. I just wanted to get it over with. And people will, people will do things to bring the guy to an orgasm just to get it over with. And this may be something they sadly learned as a kid, being sexually abused as well. When he gets off, then he leaves me alone. So, you know, if they had these thoughts, they're difficult to talk about, they may not feel safe, but if we can create the safe place for them to tell us that this is what they were thinking, and that helps us understand why they did what they did or didn't do what they didn't do, um, it can be very helpful for piecing together the whole picture of what happened. So, one way that people have found helpful is just to think about this in terms of your typical sexual assault. Um, statistically speaking, the research suggests that the majority of sexual assaults are committed by serial offenders. But the perpetrator, in most of these cases, is someone who has done it before, unfortunately. Um, they're not that stressed. Their prefrontal cortex is in control. Now, they may be compulsive about it. This may be an addictive kind of compulsive fix that they're going for that's infused with porn and other stuff, who knows. But they're not in a terrified state where they can't even think straight. And they may have, you know, they may be drunk. They may be pretty buzzed. But their prefrontal cortex is not nearly as impaired as the victim once the, the attack is sensed by the victim's brain. So they're, they're not that stressed, their prefrontal cortex is in control, they're thinking and behavior in most of these cases, I'm not saying all of them, is planned, practiced, and habitual. Whereas the victim, as we've been talking about for the last hour or so, is in a very different brain state once they realize they're under attack. Right? They're terrified, they're overwhelmed, their fear circuitry is in control, their attention and thoughts are driven by the perpetrator's actions, they're just reacting in these automatic ways to what's coming at them and their behavior is controlled by reflexes and habits. In many cases, uh, habits they developed from childhood abuse as well as from gender socialization and other stuff. But they're, you know, the bottom line is these are very different brain states in the midst of an assault. Most, not everyone, but most of them. So who's gonna have better memories? The perpetrator for how the, the, how the overall unfolding of events and all that stuff, the perpetrator is going to have a better memory. The victim is going to have a great memory for the things that their fear circuitry was focused on, you know, from moment to moment as they were dealing with the horror of it or trying to escape from it by looking at a plant or whatever. Um, but the perpetrator is going to have a lot more information, contextual information, time sequence information. No, I'm not naive. I'm not saying they're going to give it all to you. But sometimes they will cough up more than you would expect. Uh, if they feel like you know, you're really listening to them you know, as you should be. Um, so now let's shift into the end, end here. We're gonna really focus in on sexual assault and memory. So remember the beginning, I talked about bottom-up attention. You remember that image, right? The weapon focus thing. 
What the fear circuitry focus on is what seems most important to survival and coping in the moment, as we talked about. Well, we call these things the central details. What gets attention is the central focus for that person it becomes a central detail and that gets encoded. Things we're not paying attention to here right now, they may be in the periphery of our awareness, they're probably not getting encoded very well, if at all. But the things that we are paying attention to, they're more likely to be encoded. It's the same thing in sexual assault. So we can think about what we call explicit memory formation. By explicit, I mean, you know, you can remember something and say, yeah, that's a memory. I remember this happening. I remember that happening. I remember him doing this to me. I remember dinner last night with my kids. Um, encoding, consolidation. The idea is that you encode things. Everything that's happening now is getting encoded by our hippocampus into a kind of a short-term memory buffer. But it takes other processes to take that stuff and consolidate it, store it away so that it can be recalled later. And there's a very, very well-studied circuitry of this. We call it the episodic memory circuitry. It's that which allows us to remember episodes from our past, little movie clips, images from our past. And the hippocampus is a super important structure for this. And there's, you know, there's a journal called Hippocampus. There's Neurobiology of Learning and Memory. There's tens of thousands of papers on all, all this stuff right here and all the little nuances down to the millimeter areas of the hippocampus. But for your purposes, it's just helpful to know there's this circuitry that's important for encoding things into memory and then consolidating away into long-term memory. And notice that the amygdala sits right next to it. The amygdala can dramatically change the functioning of the hippocampus in a time-dependent way through Direct inputs through chemicals released by the brainstem, norepinephrine in particular, can have effects to over-consolidate things, we call it. Cortisol, stress hormones, they can affect how the hippocampus works. We don't have time to go into all those details. But basically, there's a well-studied circuitry of episodic memory, and the fear circuitry can have a huge impact on it in the midst of something like an assault. And so we go from encoding to consolidation to having a stored memory that can be retrieved when talking to an investigator or in front of an adjudicatory panel. So I'm going to give you this slide once, and then I'm going to come back to it. And this is just to, to give you an overview of what's going on in terms of memory in the midst of an assault where the person is conscious and the fear is kicked in. So first, as I've been saying all day, right, the fear circuitry kicks in. It, it becomes to dominate the brain. When that happens, it impairs the prefrontal cortex through these well-known mechanisms that Amy Arnston has shown in great detail in other labs around the world. And then both of these things conspire together to lead to top, a bottom-up attention. Fear circuitry is determining where attention goes, and the prefrontal cortex is impaired, so it can't even impose top-down attention if it wanted to. And all this affects encoding, right? Because where we attend, whoops, where we attend determines what gets encoded. The other thing that's going on, and we don't have time to go into all the details of it, is that the fear circuitry, the, the, the amygdala, is sending signals to this system called the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands. And what it's doing is it's releasing stress hormones, especially cortisol, glucocorticoids. There's the receptors they're hitting. And what happens through these hormonal and chemical effects is it alters how the hippocampus functions. And we're going to unpack that in a minute. But the hippocampus is important for encoding things that are happening as they're happening, and it's super important for consolidating them into long-term memory. What happens is through these different mechanisms and processes affecting encoding and encoding and consolidation, the more the person was terrified in the midst of an assault, the more likely they are, their memories are to be fragmented. The more likely they are to be missing certain contextual information or time sequence, which is another context, right, the context of time. So you tend to get these fragmentary sensations and emotions that, especially initially, the person may not be able to put them together. Maybe like puzzle pieces strewn on the floor and you don't have the picture and you don't have the edge pieces and how does this stuff all fit together? And so when you're the investigator talking to someone who's been through this, the memories they retrieve, they can be incomplete. They can be inconsistent, especially for peripheral details, the stuff they weren't really paying attention to. And they can be very disorganized. But, and this is what's you know, incredibly important, even though they can be fragmentary and inconsistent and disorganized in some ways, there are some aspects of the memory the, of the experience that generally we should expect them to be remembered pretty well and accurately. 
One of them, as I've talked about from the beginning, is when the fear really kicked in. And we'll talk about the brain bases for why that should be remembered, as well as just what we call the primacy effect. It was an initial part of that experience. Um, the central details, whatever was the central details for that person's brain in that terrified state, that's what got the focus, that's what got encoded, that's what got the extra oomph of norepinephrine burning it in. If someone went into a tonic immobility response, if they had the freezing response, if they had, went into a dissociative state, that stuff tends to be pretty memorable. Now you may not remember everything that happened while you were tonically immobile, of course not. But the fact that you went into that state, maybe when you came out of that state, maybe some things in the middle, these are things that people are likely to remember because they're pretty powerful experiences. And then what I call other islands of memory. So we can use different metaphors. We can look at it as puzzle pieces or we can look at it as islands of memory for certain psychophysiological states that the person was in. And it may be the freezing state, it may be tonic immobility, it may be a phase where they were struggling for a little bit like Joan did before she dissociated. There tends to be these islands of memory and you can not necessarily fill them out completely, but that's where your investigation, you don't want to be asking for some nice sequential narrative because it may not be there. If it is, great, but often it's not. And you, you know, let them lead. Now this is, uh, uh, maybe I'll skip this one because I'm running low on time, right? I gotta end by, wait, it started at like 10 of, right? Yeah. 15? Okay. I'll just tell you what this is. I won't have to subject you to it. This guy basically is a police recruit and, and, he, and his buddies shoot him because uh, he wants to see what it's like to get shot with a, a, a bulletproof vest on while the bullet goes through, he has a collapsed lung. All kinds of things are said. And the reason why I show this is, there's like, and it's a one minute video and there's so many different things that are said, but what is that guy gonna remember? He's gonna remember the pain, the, the, the terror, the, the collapsed lung and the sensations of not being able to breathe and all that. It's the same thing in a sexual assault. There's all these different things going on per unit time in a sexual assault but only some of them are gonna be the central details for that person, what their fear circuitry focused on moment to moment in the terrified state they were in. And so if you're an investigator, if you're someone looking over the results of an investigation, trying to figure out what happened here and what you're gonna do about it, it's really important that you don't get too distracted on all the little peripheral details that, that we shouldn't expect human brains to encode in a consistent way, in a reliable way over time. But what was central to that person, what they were really focused on in the midst of that assault, that should be encoded really well. And the things that people centrally focus on during an assault tend not to be the kind of things they centrally focus on when they're having consensual sex. And so there's a lot of incredibly valuable information just from understanding what was the central focus of attention for this victim in this experience. So I've talked about when the fear kicks in is incredibly important because in sexual Assault, it's different from consensual sex. We don't have these freezing responses where suddenly we realize we're under attack, we're having consensual sex. Also, from a memory perspective, which is what I'm gonna emphasize here, there's real shifts that happen in the brain when the fear kicks in into the hippocampus. So, if here on the y-axis we've got normal encoding, you know, normally functioning hippocampus, which we all have right now, and then here we got very minimal poor encoding and up there like super encoding, and here we just have a time gradient from seconds to minutes and minutes to hours. What the research of the last 10 to 15 years especially is showing is that when the, str the stress kicks in or the fear kicks in, I mean, in a laboratory with human beings, right, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be able to really terrify people, but you can stress them pretty well and it's the same chemicals that are being released. When the fear or the stress kick in, the hippocampus shifts into a super encoding mode and they're working, people are working out the neurobiology of this more and more all the time. But then there's some period, seconds to minutes, we're not sure, it might depend on how terrified the person was, they might go into this refractory period sooner. Um, but so there's this, there's this phasic thing where up, it goes into super encoding mode and then it goes into minimal encoding mode. Why would evolution select this? Well, because prediction equals survival in the world of nature. If I am 10,000 years ago, if me and some of my buddies are going down for a drink at the stream and suddenly a pack of wolves come around from behind some bushes and attack us, it's pretty much gonna be a crapshoot which one of us survives, which one of the wolves happened to attack first, who got lucky and resisted in some certain way or you know, slipped away or this or that, dumped, jumped into the stream and swam, who knows? 
what's really gonna, what our brain really wants to encode is what came before that attack so we can avoid it in the future. Maybe the birds went silent. Maybe it was a certain kind of day at this stream where they came by. Who knows? Now, some of these encodings, you know, they turn out to be not predictive, but our brain is wired to when the fear kicks in to do a, like a serious write of the information in short-term memory from just before and right when the fear is kicking in because that may have predictive value for similar attacks in the future and could mean you know survival and passing on your genes. From the perspective of the hippocampus, in, like the hippocampus, like the prefrontal cortex and every other processor, computer, brain, whatever, is a limited capacity processor. If you're going to devote resources to encoding that stuff that predicted the onset of the attack, then you've got to shift into a mode where you're devoting your resources to consolidating that and you're not taking in as much new stuff, let alone trying to consolidate it. This is the understanding that the top neuroscientists who study this stuff have, that there's, it's all about prediction and survival, encoding and consolidating the stuff that pre might predict future attack and de-emphasizing the new stuff coming in. Now, it doesn't mean nothing new comes in after that, but it has, tends to be stuff that got a lot of attention and was particularly horrifying if we're talking about assault. And so what this tells us is we should expect, right when the fear kicked in, that the person may have some really good, vivid memories, including for time sequence information. Sometimes people describe time slowing down um, and, and really absorbing a lot of stuff. But sometime after that, could be you know, a minute or so later, the memories should be expected to be much more fragmentary because the hippocampus has shifted into this refractory mode where it's not taking in as much. It's not able to process the complex array of information required to encode contextual and time sequence information. So what gets enco encoded and consolidated? Fragments burn into memory. It might just be you know, a little image of this one time he had a sneer on his face and they came in place where that wasn't the sequence of thing. It was just this awful, you know, piercing sensation they had in their vagina when this was happening. Who knows? It can be these fragments, it can be these islands of memory associated with different states when I dissociated, when I went into tonic immobility, they're not going to use that language of course. Um, few peripheral details. And peripheral means what they weren't paying attention to, not what they wish or anybody thinks they should have been attending to later, but what was not central for them. Little or no context or time sequence information after that initial fear kicks in phase. And little or no words or narrative, uh, in, especially in the immediate aftermath. And these are all things we should expect of traumatic memories. And so people will have you know, certain parts of the experience and say, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the sound of that screeching brakes of that bus, you know, if it was Joan. I'll never forget the look of that plant across the room. I'll never forget that sneer or the smell of alcohol in his breath, that cologne on his body. And now to come back to this and summarize, so the fear circuitry is in control. That's impairing the prefrontal cortex, releasing these stress hormones through the, the brainstem and the HPA axis. This is altering attention and hippocampus functioning, which is altering encoding and encoding and consolidation, which is resulting in these fragmentary memories, especially for after the fear onset, and the incomplete and inconsistent and disorganized, especially for peripheral details and context and time sequence stuff. But some aspects we should reasonably expect that they're gonna be pretty well preserved and, and recallable and consistent over time. The fear onset, the central details, these survival reflexes and other islands of memory. So a question that a lot of people have, right, of course, is, you know, does alcohol change any of this? Of course it has an impact. When we think about it in terms of fear, as I already said at the beginning, low, at low and moderate doses of intoxication, the reason, you know, for those of us who drink, you know, why do we drink, right? Part of it is to relax, to be less anxious and fearful socially. So initially, people are going to be less vigilant. They're going to miss the signals that this guy might be a predator or that he's setting me up and taking advantage of me or getting me in a vulnerable place or giving me more drinks than I want or whatever it might be. They may not notice that because they're already buzzed and we know that alcohol and, and other drugs too uh, decrease the activation of the fear circuitry. But eventually, if the person's not rendered unconscious, eventually there's gonna come a point where the danger and the assault is detected and then, then they may be even more terrified because now they're under attack and they realize that they can't really respond very well because they're intoxicated and partially or largely incapacitated. And that can be even more terrifying. So 
it can be this bimodal thing where, you know, until they detect the attack, they're not afraid at all. And then when they do, the fear is super intense because they're, they re recognize their impairment. And again, when I say recognize, I don't necessarily mean their prefrontal cortex is thinking it on. I mean like at a, a visceral automatic level. In terms of memory, we see a similar, similar thing. It depends on the dose and level of intoxication. At low doses and moderate doses and levels of intoxication, there's an impairment of the hippocampus in the sense that it's impairing the ability to encode contextual information and time sequence information because that's more high demanding processing. It does not encode, impair the encoding of sensations. And in this way, it resembles the effect of fear and trauma. So you can have this synergistic effect. Someone might have only had one or two beers and not be you know, all that impaired. Um, but when you combine that with the fear, it's conspiring to result in very fragmentary memories. But they still may have very good memories for those sensations that were the central details that they focused on. Um, whereas at higher doses and levels of intoxication up to a level of a blackout and passing out, right? You know, you've got global impairment of encoding of sensory as well as context information, of course. But it's not like alcohol just has this unitary effect. At, at low doses, it differentially impairs contextual encoding, but the person can still have very well-preserved sensory stuff coming in, and including a lot of sensory stuff that speaks to whether there was consent or fear and assault. So one way we can think about this stuff is any, you know, there's all these different ways assaults can unfold. And the, the victim may not be able to tell you the exact sequence of things. Sometimes you may be able to piece it together, but they may start out freezing and then struggle and dissociate, and then they may go into tonic immobility, which is seen as like a last-ditch survival sort of thing. They may freeze and then go straight into tonic immobility if the terror is so intense. Um, then, they, then the dissociation may kick in. So I don't want to spend too much on this, but just to say there's all these different things people can do, including, you know, sometimes people choose to be immobile, right? Because, all right, if I just don't move and I don't resist, maybe he won't kill me or hurt me worse or something like that. They may plead. They may do all kinds of stuff. So when we're investigating and listening to these cases, we just want to keep in mind that there's many different possible sequences of brain psychobiological states that people can go through. And you know, try and fill in these as islands of memory that will have gaps, but can still um, tell a very powerful story. Other key principles of memory encoding, we tend to remember the beginnings and endings of things. In the memory literature, this is called primacy and recency effects. If I list off a bunch of names of animals, you know, cat, dog, squirrel, chipmunk, rabbit, whatever, Cat and dog, and if I, an hour later I, I asked you which one of these appeared, cat and dog, are gonna be, you're going to be much more likely to remember those because they came first. And there was no other competing representations of animals that your brain was trying to encode before you heard those first two. And then the last ones, the last words I said, if I said like 20 of them, then those would be more likely to be preserved because there's no competing ones coming after that. And so these are just basic memory principles. People are going into and out of different psychobiological states over the course of an assault, and they're likely to remember the beginning of one of those states and the end of it, and maybe some really significant stuff in the beginning, in the, in the middle, um, that was particularly horrific or whatever. And of course, transitions between states are just the beginning of one and the end of another. And then the most intense elements, the things that were most painful, most upsetting, most disturbing. Um, for them in that assault. And, and from an investigation point of view, you know, a lot of what we talk about is there's different ways people can retrieve memories. We can retrieve them in a top-down way where, we, where someone says, okay, well, you said he grabbed you around the neck. What happened after that? That requires a person's prefrontal cortex to search and try and come up with some sequence thing and find out what happens next. Whereas if you just say, you know, you, you mentioned that he, he grabbed you around the neck, tell me everything about that. Tell me more about that. You're basically giving them pieces of memory in their own words, and you're saying, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Because most of the things we remember, we remember them spontaneously through associations. You hear a song, it reminds you of an ex-girlfriend. You do see this, it reminds you of what you got to get done next week. You know, there's all these things that just are associatively reminding us. And that's the same thing in these investigations. Most of the good data we get is from just giving people back a piece of their memory and saying, tell me more about that. And there's, of course, a lot more to it that I don't have time to go into, but I just want to emphasize that this is really how memory works. It's an associative thing, and if we give people back things, they are gonna, it's going to associate to so a lot more, and we'll be able to fill in those islands of memory. Because each piece we give them back 
is a node in some memory network, some network of associations among neurons distributed throughout their brain. Does that mean I'm out of time? Okay, lots of things are going on. Am I down to three minutes, I think? Yeah. Yep. So, so again, this metaphor I like to use is islands of memory. People can have these little micro islands of just sensations that you're not even, you're not even sure what state they were in when they took in that piece of information. Larger islands of these key periods within the assault. In the early phase, maybe these habit-based responses that they had. Um, when the fear kicked in, as we know, the, the hippocampus shifts into a mode where that stuff should be pretty well encoded because it goes in that super encoding mode. Survival reflexes of people had them, freezing, dissociation, tonic immobility, collapsed immobility, all these things we've been talking about. And then other things that can go on when people get to this defeat or giving up stage. You know, for a lot of victims, it's just, it's just quietly crying, just lying there helpless, overwhelmed. What they were trying to ward off has now happened. They're being penetrated and they're just crying. Um, and so, you know, that's a lot of what the defeat responses can look like, as well as these, you know, extreme survival reflexes. And I think, uh, I think maybe I should just wrap up. But, you know, based on everything I've said, right, we don't want to be expecting too much or pushing too much, whether you're the investigator or the adjudicator, um, for things that were, were peripheral details for that person in their terrified state. They're, they may not have encoded much contextual information like where things were in the room and stuff like that. Time sequence information, they may not have much of that either. They may not have much of an organized or coherent narrative, but that doesn't mean you can't collect some really good data on what they went through. Central details, very low vulnerability to distortion. It takes real bad leading questions repeated to distort the central details. Peripheral details, the things they weren't really paying attention to, those are easily distorted just by people just trying to answer a question and just filling in the gaps without even realizing they're doing it. And, but if we make this distinction, it's just not like, oh, memory is vulnerable. You know, it can be distorted like crazy. Memory is vulnerable, but central details are much less vulnerable to distortion than peripheral details. And we should always keep that in mind when we're looking at the evidence before us. Or we hear, you know, when something's being looked at as an inconsistency, or they said this this week, and they said that, or they said that before, and now they're saying this to us. Is this a peripheral detail that they weren't really paying attention to, or is this something that their attention was focused on? Because we have to weigh that evidence differently. So back to where we started, you know, trauma-informed. To do this work in a trauma-informed way, we need to understand the victim's experience. All these things I've been talking about. I've been talking about the brain bases, but these are all fundamentally about what it's like to be sexually assaulted. What happens, it kind of, how people's attention shifts, how their experience shifts, the, the behaviors they can engage in, the ways the memories come in and come back. Um, and then finally, the victim-perpetrator dynamics, because we do not want to be repeating these dynamics. We want to be doing the opposite. We want to be reaching out to people, giving them power within the limits of the situation and connecting to them in a genuine way based on an understanding of the kind of things that I've been talking about here today. So I think I'll just end with that. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>